Hello everybody and welcome back to OMB Reviews. I am the critic who is a cynic. Hope we're doing well and today we'll be talking a little bit about Dune as is it as it is expected to be released into some early markets before its worldwide release in the domestic marketplace here in the States and Canada and also of course in other countries around the world having this slow rollout. It'll be interesting to see exactly how well this works out for them. Cotton will see just how that works out. But before going any further into what they are projecting the film to make in these early weeks, go ahead and smash that like button, light up that fire button if you're watching over on Odyssey. Also, make sure you are subscribed to the channel with that bell notification turned on. That way you know every time a new video or live stream goes live on the channel. So, first off, of course, as you can see from Deadline itself, saying Gavin Newsom will keep his job. Well, California, I guess, just once more. Uh, lockdowns and less freedom, but Dune is poised to make $20 million plus dollars in the early offshore debut as it's beginning the global rollout, and this is again going to be an interesting experiment for a film that cost a pretty decent penny, though not nearly as expensive as some of the biggest budget films to come out this year. In fact, this movie cost roughly around $165 million dollars. And when you take that into account and take into account marketing costs, it means in total the film costs around $247.5 million. At least, obviously, this is not taking into account uh, the delays that we've seen for this film, among other films, and also any increased marketing costs because of having to promote this film as often as they are because of having to delay it as much. The break-even point for this movie worldwide is around $412 million. So we'll have to, of course, wait and see just how close it gets to that mark. It will be a little bit harder to track this movie as far as making projections about what I think it's going to make after the first two weeks of being uh, you know, widely available in all countries because of the fact it ha is having the slow global rollout, but um, we still should be able to find out Obviously, just you know how close it gets to that break-even number because we can just look at the budget, we can just look at the marketing costs, and be able to retroactively figure out exactly what it needs to break even. But Dune is essentially going to be making around twenty million dollars. Which, if you compare this to, again, it's kind of a good news, bad news situation for Dune because apparently, when you compare this to uh, early rollouts or early numbers for another Denis Villeneuve film, because obviously you all know if you've been watching my shows for a long time that I'm a big fan of Denis Villeneuve. He's one of my favorite modern. Uh, directors in Hollywood uh, really hasn't made a bad movie yet. I know that not everyone is a fan of his work, but I personally am. So I am very excited to see this just for that reason alone. But when compared to the box office for films like Blade Runner 2049, which, remember, was a financial failure, it actually is not too far behind, which for pandemic times is, again, a pretty nice thing to see. But at the same time, if that film ended up being a financial failure and this film does technically cost less than what that movie did you can see how it's not necessarily a, a best news scenario for this movie. So let's go ahead and dive into this article from Deadline. It says, Warner Brothers' sci-fi epic Dune is starting early rollout this weekend, looking to capitalize on momentum coming off of its star-packed world premiere at the Venice Film Festival, which was followed by an event at Paris's Grand Rex Cinema and screenings in Deauville and Toronto. Ah, yes, those Canadians. All in just the past two weeks. I love how the way it's framed in word is like, oh man, exciting stuff. It's like, hey, look, I'm excited for movies too, but at the end of the day, this is again another reminder that the elitists will have these film festivals, will have these events, and most of them probably won't be wearing any masks because, hey, rules for thee, not for me. Denis Villeneuve directed adaptation of Frank Herbert's 1965 classic will be playing in just 24 markets this weekend, beginning offshore rollout tomorrow. As of the majors going this session are France, Germany, Russia, Italy, and Spain. Our industry sources are projecting a launch in the mid $20 million range. PLFs will play a large part. IMAX is on about 150 screens. And this is where it makes the interesting point saying pandemic era uh, comparables to consider for Dude include Black Widow. While the Nuv's 2017 Blade Runner 249 is also worth noting given the film's pedigree and history. In like for like markets and at today's rates, these films opened to 22.8 and $24.4 million respectively. So as you can see, right now, it is set to probably come in a little under what we've already seen from films like Black Widow this year and from a previous and evil new film, Black, uh, rather Blade Runner 2049, back in 2017. So even though this is a relatively strong start when you compare this to maybe Blade Runner, uh, the fact that that film came out before pandemic times, it is still one of those things to look to to understand that that movie again, did not make enough money to make up its massive budget, was not a real financial success. Then again, when you look to the original Blade Runner, 
you can kind of see like a very similar, uh, you know, strategy there. And that's why I honestly feel like Dune is one of those films and one of those stories where there's obviously a lot of people passionate about the story and, and really want to see the adaptation and want to see an adaptation done well. You know, especially done better than I know that some people do like the original Dune film, right? Do love the original David Lynch version of Dune, which I actually have a copy of. Um, but at the end of the day, it's just a film that I think most people just generally watching films are going to say, this is a little bit too bizarre for me because David Lynch was, you know, very much a bizarre filmmaker. However... This one is in the hands of Denis Villeneuve, and even though he has indeed delved into the bizarre with films like Enemy, he also knows how to make some mainstream, mainline films as well. For instance, his film Sicario is still, I think, one of the best films of the last 20 years because of just how well-crafted it was, not only with his direction, but also with the story coming in by Taylor Sheridan as well. So I think that this is a good indication that we're going to have a, a pretty good film in this just based on the history of Villeneuve um, beforehand. However... That does not necessarily mean that the financials are actually going to be there. From what I've been hearing, it sounds like the movie is actually relatively good. It's that the marketing for it, at least according to Midnight's Edge, the marketing is not doing many favors to and for this movie. And so that might have an impact. I mean, as we all know, marketing does have an impact on movies, does have an impact on how well or how poorly films do. Great example of this would be the film Dread, right? When that movie came out, the marketing was so bad, people didn't go to see it. And then all of a sudden, when people did watch it, they said, no, the marketing is making it look terrible, but it's actually an awesome movie. And it had a second life in the, um, you know, the post-release putting out on Blu-ray and 4K. And now the fact that they even put it out on 4K and had special edition uh, steelbooks for it shows you just the amount of support that that film really has to the point where people are clamoring for a sequel to a movie where it's like we, we're so sequeled out in our modern age and culture. And yet people are asking for sequels when it comes to films like that. So my hope is that they're able to maybe capture that here with Dune as well, make enough money. And again, it's not because I want them to make enough money to be able to justify a sequel. It's because I want the film to be good, and I want it to be so good that they're able to justify continuing on the story, because obviously Dune is from a series of books, so it'd be really cool just to see that happen. But do I think that's going to happen? Again, at this point, looking ahead, $20 million opening up in this limited marketplace compared to other films and other uh, releases similar. Again, it's not really looking all that great for it. Obviously, $400 plus million is not completely out of reach in today's market, but it is going to be a lot more difficult, especially since this is going to have an HBO Max release, and that is going to definitely come into play when it comes into the numbers. As it says here, anticipation is high for Dune in Europe, and there's a fair bit of rain washing across the continent over the coming days, which is music to distribution and exhibitions ears. Then again, the long time, uh, the long run time will impact the number of showings it can have because the film only hits HBO Max on October 22nd. In line with the domestic release, piracy may be less of a concern, at least in terms of pristine copies. And I think that is a fair point to make. Because obviously piracy has been a huge problem with these day and date releases because you have been able to get access to really high quality versions of these movies. And so no longer are you dealing with really bad, you know, cameras inside theaters and and trying to you know deal with that and all the ads that usually pop up into it. Now you're getting, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of people being able to record these screen record these from their apps and from these different services and put them out. And it's very hard for any of these studios to really be able to crack down on that in any in any significant way. So having one this early rolling release only in theaters could end up being to its benefit. But once it hits HBO Max. And especially if there's a you know, positive good word of mouth, that could have an impact. What my other hope is, is that the film is so good and is so powerful that people say, hey, I actually want to go see this in a movie theater. I actually want to go see this in an IMAX screen. I know that for me, I you know would love to be able to see this in the biggest screen possible, especially if I start to hear from, you know, again, reviewers that I trust that this film is worth seeing and is worth seeing in, in a big screen. I'll be looking especially to people like Jeremy Johns and, and what they have to say about the subject as well. And I think that that is something that could also potentially benefit this movie is if people are willing to go pay that premium price for those premium formats, then that could also be a very good sign for the studio being able to make a little bit more money there. As it says, critical reception and word of mouth were strong out of Venice, where the movie received an extended standing ovation. It's currently carrying 87% fresh score on Rotten Tomatoes. So just a reminder that, you know, Rotten Tomatoes does not mean anything because ever since especially they started to play around with their algorithms and play around with their numbers, really you can't, you already couldn't really trust the uh, critic score. You know, we kind of pointed that out in the last couple of years. But then once they went in and really started to tweak the audience rating too, to the point of deleting audience scores, that also I think made it indicating that, yeah, Rotten Tomatoes just is not a very good metric 
anymore about whether a film is good or not. But it is really exciting to know that it did get a standing ovation. But I, I will again point out here that you have people on stage. It looks like that actually you have some of the stars at the very least wearing wearing some masks, some of the people there. So, hey, at least they're kind of, you know, fitting the narrative, I guess you could say, at something that's a little bit less publicized, I guess you could say. Um, but it is interesting. Uh, just to see that happen in the way that it is happening as such. But going into it again, uh, it says right here, this also gets a jump to the September 29th rollout of James Bond. So No Time to Die is going to get a similar type of rollout over time. So it'll be interesting to see how that works. The difference is that James Bond costs significantly more. And we'll talk more about what that film needs to make in order for it to break even. But it's well over $500 million for that movie. And we'll see if it's going to even get close to it. But as it says here, essentially we're in for a long ride at the international box office. Dunes Middle East markets start up on September 22nd with Japan and some other Asian and e EMEA markets on October 15th, followed by Korea, UK, some smaller Euro markets, all of Latin America during October 20th frame. Australia, given the state of cinema closures, is currently dated December 2nd. So Australia really isn't known for giving too much money for the box office at the very least. So... That shouldn't have too much of an impact about whether, you know, to determine this film's financial success or not. But it is interesting just how many places this film is coming out before the domestic release, especially since the domestic release really has been kind of like the biggest producer of money during this pandemic time. If you don't count, uh, you know, native releases in, in places like uh, Japan, for instance, which have done really well uh, for films like Demon Slayer, for instance, you really find that most of the money that is coming for these films is, is really coming from the domestic marketplace. And you look to, um, you know, obviously you look to just how Shang-Chi was able to let basically only get money because of how well it's doing in the domestic marketplace. It is interesting that they are again trying this out. It seems to me likely a, a an attempt to try and curtail any piracy especially in the European countries, if they were to do a early release or a day and date release all at the same time, you know, in the United States across the world, because obviously with HBO Max and piracy, that would make it just a little bit harder to make more money. So it is, again, an interesting strategy. We'll see if it plays out for them. But $20 million opening for this early release. Again, it's both a good and bad thing. It's good in that it's relatively performing around the same as other films that made Money to the point of almost getting so assuming that this movie makes the same as Black Widow, for instance, it wouldn't quite be profitable, but it would at least be close to profitability. Whereas if this film is something similar to Blade Runner 2049, right, we start to see that if it's performing as well as a movie pre pandemic, that is still in essence a, a good start. It is still in essence a, a good reaction, whether or not it makes money for them or not still remains to be seen. But what are your thoughts about this? Are you excited to see Dune? And do you think that this early release schedule is going to work for them and that this $20 million that they suspect the film is going to make in these early markets is a good indication and is a good start? Let me know in the comment section below. If you like this video, smash that like button, light up that fire button over on Odyssey. It really does mean a lot. You're all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless. And now for a huge shout out to all of my September Locals Patreon and Subscribe Star members. First with my Locals members, Cats App, D Sharp, It's a Modern Major General Story, Laura Bifford de Havitt, and Robert Barnes. I want to give a shout out to especially to Laura, who is now a double supporter on Locals and on Patreon. So thank you for that. And to all of my Locals members. A shout out also to my Patreon members, Andrew Hoyle, animation commentator, Brandon, Brian P., Christopher Bowman, Don Bruno de la Mancha, Father Christopher Miller, Hail to you, Father, Father Damian Cook, Garrett Searles, Hannibal Grimm, Harold Francis, Inflamed Wood, Jacob Juice, Jeffrey Toon, Joe Horn, Jonathan Carney, Gomer Kyle 79, Laura the Modern Major General Story once again, Mike Jackson, Mad Mitch Dunaway, Mondo Spieler, Mr. Peabody, On to June, Orange Hat Reviews, Out of Step with Reality, Priscilla Hall, Rosetta Ullen, Teresa Martin, Theodore Benden, Tina Bojan, and Tina B, the Empress of the Universe, and a shout out also to my subscribe star members, The R, Fast Reaction, Nosferatu Gatsu, John B, Perpetual Punster, Mr. Roy, Glinzer, J. Alex McCarthy Jr., Dean Heiss, Slash, The New Number Two, J. Ra, The Beer Guru, and ZK Man. Thank you all very much for supporting the channel. And I want to give a huge shout out to new members, one time supporters over on Locals, Kara Tharp, K Tharp 56, and Brett D 90. Thank you again for being a one time supporter over on Locals, and also to my newest Patreon member, Stan Gunovic. 
and hopefully I pronounced that correctly. But thank you for being my newest members. It really does mean a lot. And if you want to have your name shouted out at the end of every single video or live stream on the main channel, please check out the links in the description below, specifically that top link, which will bring you to all of the links to my various social media pages and also places of support as well. And remember that if you join at the Army of Asgard level, you also get access to giveaways of 4K titles. Right now, I have a live giveaway of Snatch on 4K Steelbook. I've also got ones for Dread, uh, Wrath of Man Blu-ray. I've also got A Quiet Place Part 2 on 4K. I've got Top Gun on 4K, Sicario on 4K, tons of films and more to come, especially as more films are getting released for those giveaways. At the uh, Keeper of the Bifrost level, you get all that, plus you get access to an exclusive podcast, podcast that I do with John the Flickpick Flickinger. Not only do you get to listen to the podcast, you also get to ask questions that we answer as much as we can and as fully as we can in much more, I guess you could say, uncensored way, but again, a much more free-flowing way for our members over there at the Keeper of the Bifrost level and above. And if you join the Chosen of Valhalla level, you get access to all of those things. Plus, in your first month, you get a free t-shirt, your choice, and I send it to you no matter where you are in the world. And also, you get to once a month be featured on the channel in the Chosen of Valhalla live stream where we talk about movie, news, and pretty much anything that you want to talk about. So if that all sounds like fun to you, check out those links below. You're all amazing and beautiful people. Hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. And as always, God bless.